Okay, um, I would like to introduce today's uh, presenter. Uh, and uh, it goes along with my idea of trying to uh, keep these exciting and to do different things. So I'm not exactly sure what Michael's going to do, but uh, <laughs> this is a good thing for artists. You know? it, it, it helps us to approach uh, our work and always be ready for something we didn't expect. Um, Michael Ackerman paints, sculpts, builds furniture, writes, and participates in numerous other creative endeavors. In his artist, artist statement, he explains, I create things for one purpose, to be alive. <laughs> to distill my life down to its simplest terms, and to be simply what I am, a human male, nothing more, nothing less. Each time I design something ergonomic, when I'm painting or sculpting, I found that by letting go of the form, the line, the color, by letting it be raw, by accepting it as it really is, something new emerges. The final object or image is never the one I saw in the beginning. It is more. So with that introduction, I'd like to introduce Michael Ackerman. going on inside of us that you know, we don't let out. I know I do. As much as I've been able to get these things that are boiling around in me out onto something, there's still more. And it scares the crap out of me. <laughs> I think it's the hardest thing in life to, um, to take off our masks, the very masks we wear. So there's a statement that I think we're most familiar with in terms of psychology that's if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get a different result, that's a form of insanity. <laughs> and yet, we're all <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so so, um, when you came in the room, you sized the place up, you made some choices where you're sitting, who you're sitting next to, and if you look around, you'll see that there aren't any two of us alike, we're all different, and yet we live in a world that's all about conformity, being the same in some way, and it works nice in terms of stopping and stop signs and you know, all but the thing we're really after is, is who are you, who am I, who are each of us as an individual? So going back to that idea that doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, only is insanity. I'm going to ask you to do something that's different than what you came in this room with. Notice all your minds are spinning. <laughs> and so, um, I'm going to make a couple requests. We don't have a lot of time here. Usually this thing that I do here has got more time uh, available for it. So, what I want you to do is something that will change your whole experience of the room. The chair you're sitting in. The insanity you repeated. You're probably sitting in the same chair or the same part of the room you do in all of these meetings. I'm the guy that always sits in the front row. <laughs> all right, so I'm asking you to trust yourself and trust me. So everybody close your eyes. Silence is palpable, isn't it? You can feel yourselves. Can you feel your feet on the floor? Your hind end on the chair? The tension in your eyes? The piece of paper you're gripping? The sound of my voice? The hum of the air conditioning, the amount of light that seems to be around your eyes, 
Some of you opened your eyes. So all kinds of things happen. Our bodies are the way we're experiencing this. And our most ingrained thing, this thing called survival, please close your eyes, is why you opened your eyes at that. Why when you came in the room, you sat in a certain place. So the reality is, is every moment's a new moment. Everything's a new opportunity. Not only is the paper you have in your hands a blank canvas, your entire life is a blank canvas. When you give up, your need to survive, your need to be right, your need to draw that picture exactly the way it is in your mind, get that emotion on there, mix that color, all those kinds of things are a habituation. Now certainly, we have to have, have hand-eye skills to produce something. You know, I had to talk in many different ways to be able to communicate. This is what I'm saying. You know, I always talk right or move right. You know, I couldn't understand what I'm saying. I did. So, what you're really after in whatever your medium is, whatever your relationship to somebody else is to connect, to get that which is in you out. And I'm offering to you that if you allow yourself to shift your senses, because you're used to seeing a color, seeing the world, seeing a person, seeing everything the way you see it right now, and if you can learn to let go of that and trust yourself, here you are in a room with some level of trust. You've got your eyes closed and you're listening to my madness. A different kind of thing for you. Okay, please keep your eyes closed. If you have a piece of paper, hold it up in front of your face, but do not open your eyes. Your minds are spinning again. Isn't that cool? All right. In a moment, I'm just going to stop speaking. And when you're just ready, comfortable for yourself, open your eyes. something happen. It could be as simple as, this guy's nuts, I didn't <coughs> see anything, or something else came to you. The point is, is something happened, whether it was something large or small. It could be just nothing. But those are your tools. Those are the things that are available to you. If you have a pencil or a pen, whatever you have. I do have, uh, if anyone needs it right at this point, I do have paper here. If you need paper, um, uh, please raise your hand while I here. We do have some pencils back there if you don't have them ready. Who needs paper? How much do you need? Do you need several pages? Just one sheet. Give her six. <laughs> <laughs> Give her six, Bill. Give her I'm six. This is stiff paper, so I need two sheets, so it's, it's a little bit. Um, um, so far, I'm okay, but I have two. I have two. Well, I have Okay, so I have, I'd like to ask a question. Has anybody put anything on the paper yet? No. Who said yes? What did you do? I put, when I'm, my eyes were shut, so it's kind of blurry, I put shift senses because I thought I was taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Open up is what I wrote. <laughs> See things differently. Okay. Michael Ackerman, who 
who am I? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, no, that's, that's that why we're all me, sitting here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Repeating you. You're really different. <laughs> I take that as an honor, yeah. and I, I, I think the reason we're all sitting in here is for that very thing, so that we can each say, I am me, I am different, I am my own unique gift to the world, and yet we're still afraid of that. We're afraid to be who we are, whether it's the stuff we're putting on paper, a canvas, a sculpture, that really important stuff, our families, our, our place in the community, all those things. So my, my sense of this in, in my own art of, of the world I was maturated in um, and had to cope with, uh, I got lost in it. And I became what I needed to become so that I could, quote, survive. You know, I had to get along with my parents. I, I'm one of those people that we got pregnant at 18, so I took that on, and now I'm a father and a husband, and blah, 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 blah. And in all those roles, which are certainly ones we all have, we get lost. And I would imagine everybody in this room has a piece of art they've made, something boiling around in them that you want to create that's based on those very things, your relationships to people, animals, the world, whatever your spirituality is, all those things. Now notice that so far all we've heard is words on paper. How many in here are writers? Okay. Did you come here to write? No. Okay. So notice the resistance that is there that you have a blank canvas in front of you and you're so intent on learning from me or listening or writing words, which certainly I appreciate. I enjoy doing this. At the same time, it sends you down an angle of, or a reality of, I must learn from, or I must know this. And I'm one of those people that believes everything you need to know is right there with you, in you, around you, at all times. And it's the socialization, the training, that keeps you from just being willing to <coughs> throw it out. We are all afraid. And art is that thing that transcends the cultural life experience in every epoch we have. If, you're, if there is an archaeological dig, what's the most important thing? What, are, what, is, what, what is valued the most? It's either the art objects or the artification of the thing, the artisticness of the, the structure or the comb or the bed or the chair, all those things. And we're interested in those things because that uniqueness of that time period, that individual poured all that into that. We don't really need any difference in chairs. All we need is something to sit on, right? So you're missing the opportunity for yourself, for those you care about, for you to have that pleasure of saying, I made this. Don't you feel good, in the, at least in the process of while you're working, when you just get lost in? You know, there's that, that, uh, that fear going in, that trepidation. Um, I know in my own case, um, I was doing a, a, a painting that's this woman standing on a box falling off, and she's like this. And, my initial sketch was <laughs> so bad. <laughs> and I, I said to myself, you know, give it up. Don't, you'll never get there. 
And in my case, art is, is you know, emerged in the latter part of my life. It's not something uh, I did as a child. It was, was my um, slowing down, my giving myself the time and space, uh, as we did a little minute ago, cut out senses, cut out various things to begin to orient and see the world and experience in a different way. And in my case, painting, something I didn't know I was interested in, came out. So this sketch I was doing, as I said, was just terrible. And so I went for a walk, uh, was living downtown San Luis, went down to the farmer's market, came back, and, and I spent my time, once I got past condemning myself, being with what that was. And I went back, and uh, I was amazed at how well I sketched the hands. Hands are hard to, to draw, to sketch. And, um, and then I was paid a compliment by somebody who had far more experience than me about that, so it emboldened me. But it drove home the point that it's about connecting, it's about tuning in. One of the things I pride myself about art is I'm an outsider. I have no training whatsoever in art. Everything that I do is my uniqueness, good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> I can't blame it on somebody else. I didn't have to unlearn somebody's technique or all those things. And I got there because of what I'm offering you today, that what you need is just inside you. Does it mean you know, not to benefit from uh, being exposed to other artists and learning all that stuff. I'm not trying to say, you know, pox on, on workshops and lessons and things like that. What I'm really trying to say is, is that what's underneath all that, the important thing is you. Um, did you guys see the Pollock film with Ed Harris? So my favorite part of that movie is when, um, uh, what's her name, Krasner? Uh, uh, his, his future wife. There's a scene where uh, she's come to his apartment, knocks on the door and says, you know, I'm going to be in a show with you and I need to know what your art's like. So she goes in the apartment and looks around and they're talking and she asks him who he studied with. And he gives a name and she pauses for a little bit and she says, well, I don't see any of his influence in your work. And here's the point. His response was, yeah, it took me 10 years to get out of there. <laughs> so, um, uh, fortunately, I read your email about bringing something to you know, be the uh, whatever auction given to the to Pastor Robles Art Association, and it worked out perfect for for this this little piece. This is a you play canvas print. And um, let's just pass it around. Uh, so I was doing a painting workshop, and I got kind of bored. And so I set up a, a 3 by 4 and an 18 by 24 canvas. And I took a bunch of French ultramarine and reduced it with stand oil. And I thought I was just going to be putting the background on. And it was just, that's where I was. And uh, I had a 6 inch regular putty knife like to use in construction because that's part of my background. I use all kinds of implements as well as these. And so I took the stand oil and uh, took a brush to get it on the canvas and then I took a six inch knife and I just and wow <laughs> and uh, it was so viscous that if I didn't take it off the wall and lay it down it would have just sheeted out. And uh, so I did two paintings uh, with that combination that I just said, and that was it. It took me longer to mix the paint than it did to go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it was, as you've experienced, one of those kind of magic moments where things just sort of flow. And, and uh, this piece I call it Blue Note, but uh, and that's a naming after the fact. That's just a sample of just going to the canvas, 
and letting her rip. Okay, has anybody drawn anything? <laughs> What did you draw? Well, when I had my eyes closed, for some reason, I saw diamond shapes. Mm -hmm. So I drew, I just put the diamond shape down. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of, I don't know why. Yeah, but, but the other part of it is, is, you know, I'm speaking English, and I spoke some slurry kind of stuff earlier that was still English-based. So we, you know, we have <laughs> these articulations that are just simply symbols and labels for what we're experiencing. What we're experiencing is so much deeper, wider, larger than any word we can come up with. Um, I was working with somebody the other day and I, I asked them, uh, uh, can you connect to what we use the word acceptance to model? Because when we accept something, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just goes on. You know, and it changes our connectedness to, to others and ourselves. And, but we get lost in form, the words. Those of you that write, you know, when you're writing, you're, you're, you're caught up certainly in our languaging in terms of proper spelling and all that, which is only kind of a modern thing. We've only had dictionaries and standardized spelling for a couple hundred years. Cow actually can be K O W. And we can understand it. Though we'll overlay on that, this person's illiterate or they can't spell. But we still got the thing we get milk from. So, <coughs> you see, I'm doing the same thing I'm asking you to do. I'm just giving myself some room here to see where this is going next, because I don't really know. I knew I was going to be standing in front of you guys. I created the theme, but I had no idea really how I was going to go in, and once I was in, where I was going to go. It just follows. In public speaking, they call it extemporaneous. I wrote something on my paper, which I don't know why. Wayne Dreyer. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Have you ever read any of his books? Sure, sure. I think he has influenced you. Yeah, that whole um, uh, genre of what's available to us is mm -hmm. certainly part of, of what's influenced me. So, um, again, that going back to everything we know is inside of ourselves and it's available and yet I've read Mr. Dreyer and lots of other people and you know I'm 61 now so <laughs> I've certainly absorbed a lot and yet I have found that no matter what I have learned from any anything outside me it still only comes to have a, a sense or a meaning or a value for me when I personalize it, when I glean these pieces from here and there. Um, and it's, it's an expensive process. You're afraid to do these things that are boiling around inside of you because you get what cost you. You didn't get your fear without getting spanked whether it was, you know, we're all old enough that we got the corporal punishment stuff. Right? Yeah. I've been in the principal's office this way. <laughs> um, and then there's all the other forms of getting spanked. And in my own case, um, I've lost various uh, key individuals in my family for periods of time because just in my organic makeup, I'm the guy that was always willing to talk about stuff get down to what really is going on. So that's threatening to people, uh, especially your parents. <laughs> and, uh, and then when, in my case, well, my beginning to paint, for example, uh, was in the late 90s. I lived on the bluff edge of Napomo. Off my deck was the valley below. It was about 300 feet down. And uh, <coughs> All of a sudden, I was, have you seen the, the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I think it's called? 
Remember when he's building the mountain in the living room? That freneticness? Yeah. Well, that happened to me when it was painting. And that's really how I started. I had no <laughs> knowledge of it. And I had said to my community at the time, um, my stuff's either going to be interesting or it's a frisbee to throw off the back of that. Because I'm painting my shit. And, and so uh, I had no idea when I was doing that uh, that I would be where I am today with all those things. Uh, in my case, um, I'm unabashed about the fact that my art is purely my therapy. And I offer that's really what it is for you too. And that the reason we connect to a piece of art, whatever the form, is because that individual took the risk of putting themselves on that canvas, in that writing, in that film, in that sculpture, whatever the list you want to make, in such a human way and in their own unique way that when we experience that, we connect. We get it. And so I can tell everybody, you don't have to really speak the right language, but you can get the fun grass. So we have realism, impressionism, abstract guys like me. The point blows out. And I know in my own case, the, uh, uh, the first time I really exposed myself was uh, the very first uh, Open Studio store, which you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with. And um, I was unique enough even then that I wound up with uh, news coverage by by uh, uh, a TV station, they opened their news that night to come out of the studio store in my studio. They interviewed me at their reception. They even came and closed the news out at my place that night. Why? Because my ship was on those canvases. And um, now I got lost. <laughs> where I was going. Uh, well, yeah, where I was at with that is, is that that it's about getting yourself on there and being unabashed about it. It's, there's a place for, for fine skills and doing detailed work and all that stuff. And there's a place for that. And trust yourself. You'll know when to, to do those things. I guarantee you that if you will stop practicing insanity, stop approaching your paintings, your relationships, everything you have going on in the way you're doing it, you'll scare the crap out of yourself and your life will change. <laughs> um, something I recommend is that you journal write. Uh, I started uh, back in the mid-90s. And within a year, knowing intellectually that um, writing with the other hand, using the other hand, builds the other side of the brain. I'm naturally right-handed. Um, I now probably write better left-handed than right-handed. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised that your fear about writing with the other hand is unsubstantiated. Because unlike when we were kids, we didn't understand the symbols, all the stuff that that's about, while we were trying to learn how to do the symbols. You know all that stuff. So it will be much easier for you to use the other hand. In my own case, um, in through my little, my forehead and my temple, I could feel this spot in my head kind of vibrating. It eventually made me nervous enough that I went to my physician and told him what I was, was going on and what I was feeling. And he gave me the same answer my metaphysical community said. My metaphysical community said, oh, your third eye is opening up and you know, all that <laughs> stuff. And my physician, which I could more relate to at the time, said, well, because you're writing with your left hand, you're rebuilding the bridges, the synapses, the way your mind is working. Uh, we're all old enough here to know Flip Wilson. <laughs> the devil made me do it. Yeah. So we have that cliche thing where there's a part of us that says, 
let's go do this. And the other one's going, hey, wait a minute. You better not do that. So I found that as I used the medium of writing and both hands, that that debate changed from a debate to a, well, you know, we ought to go over there and do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, we're there, we could do this. It became more orchestrated, more supportive one of the other. It wasn't yes, no. And the reality is, is that we all have to stand in front of the mirror. We all sleep with ourselves. We never get away from that. We all stand before whatever our spiritual relationship is. We stand before everyone in our lives. Why not stand as who you are? Billy. Uh, you touched on an interesting point, and, and that's just kind of you know, letting yourself go. Uh, something that fascinates me, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, is the fact that I look at sketches, my, my initial sketches for an idea, and they're just full of energy, they're just bursting. And But then I have this feeling that I need to polish them up. You know, I need to massage this area, this area, to make it stronger, or to bring out certain points. But I can't escape the fact that I usually go back to the initial sketches because they're so powerful. What's the difference between those two, uh, in your thoughts, those two uh, uh, impulses? Um, personal experience with that, and I don't know if it's still up or not because Google has changed their, um, their relationship with films. But there's a film I have on Google called Bridge Over Evil Heaven. And it's exactly what Bill's talking about. I did this, and it's a big canvas, it's like a five by six. And I did this frenetic um, sketch of uh, this blues singer I used to date as this genie coming out of a bottle and just being scary as hell. And it sat for two years. And I finally was ready to paint it. And that process of the energy that goes into the sketch, that first blush, whether it's the sketch or just some color thrown on the canvas, whatever that is, it changes. It's always changing. And in a way, we try to paint inside our own lines. So as you're saying, Bill, that doesn't necessarily work so well you're, because we, we get to thinking too much about it. So in the case of this painting, I, I, there's, there's always three choices. Jessel it out, try and go inside the lines and the energy that you started with, or allow something else to happen. The original sketch in this painting was, called, was going to be called Evil Heaven. And so I let myself go to the canvas with the who I was now and the morph of what that particular image and relationship was about and I just let it become something else and so I went from uh, in that case uh, a heavy impasto kind of technique to all just all washes and the sketch is hidden in between inside there uh, so it's visible because of all the washes and um, this Buddha like thing appeared and <laughs> you know all these things so my answer to that is that, that you already know what you put on there. That sketch you started with that had all that energy, you already experienced that. And what you're really doing is not freeze framing a specific moment, though sometimes like the thing I just sent around really is just a moment, but it's so simple it's one color and just a bunch of this. The reality is the movement, the arc of the relationship, the arc of the experience. So um, if, if I stood up here and talked to you like this with the same words, it would be very different than the way I have been talking. So it's, it's letting yourself move with that. Because the reality is, is when you look at your own work, Bill, you see start to finish every time you look at it, right? And so for you, it's your 
that's pain. Same with me. Um, the, it's the energy that's in there. And the final thing that's left behind is what the rest of us will see. Um, on the therapy aspect of this, a story that relates to that, I had a, uh, have a, a friend in construction, and I was painting, and he was seeing what it was doing for me, and he said, hey, can you teach me to paint? And, well, okay, so, um, got a three foot by four canvas and a bunch of oil paints, and, and we're in conversation, and he's painting these simple things about his you know, hearts and flowers, <laughs> and he's going through a breakup with a wife and adopted kids and, and all these things. And as we're talking and he's painting, it keeps changing. And it keeps changing. Doesn't all your work keep changing as you work with it? And here's the point. At the end, he put his hands on the canvas, and it was oil, so it's still very malleable. And he just rubbed the canvas and the it was gallery wrap and, and the edges, and it became this monolithic mob. Every image was gone. And it taught me to take pictures, <laughs> which I've always done since. But because <laughs> it's amazing what happens in the process. And so I encourage you guys to, to do that. Do a static camera like I have over here, or stop and take pictures. Um, but the point is this. When it dried, he took it home. He hung it over his couch. He was happy with what he saw in that canvas. And I can remember, you know, a lot of what's in that canvas, but what everybody sees is just this mob, and not a very good one in my mind. <laughs> anyway, as the story continues with that piece, his friends all heard about what he'd done, and they wanted to come and see it. And, you know, this may bend some of your wickets, but the energy that's in there, all those images, they're still there. All that stuff is still there. And strangely enough, his friends, not out of pure politeness, said, I don't know why, but I kind of like that. <laughs> so to me, that so well drives home the point that we want to hold on to something. You know, we want to hold on to that initial sketch that initial feeling, that initial concept. And the reality is, is there's not a damn thing in your life you can hold on to. Not a damn thing. And so, get with the flow. Let the entire dynamic of your experience go into what you do. And leave the judging out there. If you're going to edit everything you do while you do it, you take away the first blush of the sketch, you take away the shift in the power of the next thing, it's gone. This may disturb you a little, but um, I think everybody in here probably likes sex to some degree. And as we age, we certainly have gained experience with that. And when you've had a particularly good sexual experience, do you remember every little thing? Can you write it out? <laughs> All those things you did that the other person did. Can you do that? Well, to a degree, maybe so. But you get the point. And do you want to go do it again? Yeah, so maybe your whole life could become that way, where it's got that much connectedness, that much beauty and power, because you're letting yourself have the experience of what you're doing. Rather than, oh, well, can I kiss you again? I, I, I just didn't, you know. <laughs> maybe I should have a mint. <laughs> So, you know, it's, our lives are so constrained, so restricted by the fact that we are civilized and socialized. 
and yes, there's a value to that. We had a point in time, and here we are. So we, we all are having this experience because we followed those, those things. But it's outside of that. That's where the juice is. That's what you want to get out of you. And out and out and out. And the amazing thing is, is whatever version of you shows up, there's a world out there for it. There is. So be who you are. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stop with this comment. Um, back in my house, very active house design build days, uh, I had some young guys working for me, and uh, I would start the day with coffee and you know, kind of organizing the day. And one day I asked a couple of them, if you could play guitar like Jimi Hendrix and sing like Elvis, who would you be? And, oh, I'd have it made. No, you're just another imitator. <laughs> I don't care how good you are. You're just another imitator. Elvis is Elvis because Elvis did Elvis. Yeah. All that stuff. And Hendrix is Hendrix, and whoever else you want to come up with. Frank Sinatra, I don't care. Just name somebody that, that became an icon. Because they became themselves. Be the icon that you are. Good luck. Um, in my, in my, my view of painting or any kind of art, there's, there's always two uh, elements. One is to become a master of your craft, whatever that is, even if that's the process. And the other part of it is to develop yourself as a person so that you have something to say. Um, at first, when you start doing it, if, if, if we can get over the, uh, the initial fear of it, we're much more instinctual. And I think that's where the sketches that are powerful come in. And then we turn on the intellectual side and we try to work the two together. The question I have is do you, do you have any practical processes to, uh, to work at being? instinctual in your concept and how you put it out there and not lose that instinct as your intellectual side of it. Uh, it learns to grapple with all of these things. Is there any suggestions? Uh, my suggestion is, is uh, allow yourself, allow yourself to screw up. Make art so that it can be destroyed. It's your attachment to <coughs> wanting it to be a masterpiece, to wanting it to be articulatable. It's all those things that get in the way. And, and um, I had a friend say to me years ago uh, a little story. Um, there was a group of people that were given uh, six months of time, space, and all the materials they wanted. And they told part of the group, make one really good thing. Make one masterpiece. See how much you can paint. See how much stuff you can paint. The result was, is this group over here that was after the masterpiece stayed in their heads, worked hard, did preliminary sketches, they did all that stuff. This other group, they just started making stuff. And at the end of the time period, the amount of work that others thought was great work and that the artists themselves felt really good about came from which side? Free side. So in so many ways, um, I'll use film, very powerful <coughs> medium of art. Uh, I never really appreciated the old statement that talking ruined the movies. Back from the silent film era into the talking area, and I'm sure you've all seen the artists now. Mm -hmm. And the best films are the ones that you can actually 
turn the volume off, and you can follow the story by what the people are doing, how they're emoting, how they're relating to the, you know, all the space, all those things. So, obviously, language, articulation is an important thing. I'm using it. We're using it. But the sad but true is, is it's the biggest barrier to you letting you just be you. And so, um, let yourself make bad art. Whatever the hell that is. <laughs> and take some of your art and destroy it. It's part of the beauty of, of um, you can't think of the right name, go ahead. Well, it's a release, yes. But I'm thinking of, of uh, sidewalk painting, chalk painting. What's that called? Good, you're blank like I am. <laughs> but that's part of the process of that. All that work, all that beauty. And then. Art is a teaser. I'm all in art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so we have art in the teaser up here okay. around our park. All right. Much better. All right. <laughs> the kids, the kids, they come out, they do just glorious things out of their own spirits and their own minds. And, it isn't and, masterpieces, but it's masterpieces. Yeah, see, and, and, and to me, you're, you're demonstrating what I'm saying. It's, it's that out of the mouths of babes. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just letting it rip, as opposed to you know, wanting to win the prize or get the name or, or all those things. And um, you know, I, obviously I wasn't around, but to think of Picasso and Brock and all the things that they moved through, the position they got themselves into, like, well, let's just do this and see what they did. <laughs> you know, they just let themselves go. And look how they, the lives they created for themselves and how they moved the world. So who has a drawing? <laughs> cool. Can I see them? This is what? Doodles. And you said you what? Don't want it to be seen? <laughs> Have you been listening? Okay, so we're going to start with doodles. Did you hear that? Very cool. Yeah, there's, there's some flowers. And, and there's some other ones shooting away or streaming away or falling away. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, this almost looks like a, a looped rug, but it's also like rows of people, one standing on top of the other. <laughs> <laughs> Left hand. So we have, uh, the way I'm going to interpret this is we have two canvases. And um, uh, it's almost, I make that a, a, almost a human figure with wings flying into it, is how I would interpret that. <laughs> this is cute. So here we have um, a hand holding up, uh, I'm going to make that a book and two hands holding up some paper, <coughs> and uh, the process of looking at the paper, and eyes, and um, I see that as either a heart or a yoni. It's <laughs> supposed to be a heart. <laughs> see, you just stuck with what people see. <laughs> um, fear, 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 destroy, uh, uh, mask, um, a uh, almost a ghost-like figure with uh, some wings, uh, icon, and all these little, uh, um, I'm going to call them idea creatures, spinning around above the head. Ah. 
eye of the beholder. <laughs> oh. Portrait. Go to canvas, let it rip. What is in me? I want to be accepted. Art is my therapy. Risk. Yeah. <laughs> That's you. That's me. Can I keep this? <laughs> you have your heaven behind but, you. Yeah. And you got to sign it. It's not evil heaven. <laughs> Those lights, Michael, the lights behind you make you look like you're a spiritual being sharing with us. Oh, really? Well, thank you. That's kindness. I mean, it's like a holy grail coming to us. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's uh, on the table back there, if you have interest, there's my card and website and all that stuff. And then um, I have a workshop system uh, that I call Art Always Reveals Truth. And uh, I'm also doing a workshop now through the uh, uh, museum in San Luis, uh, starting to get booked up for um, a thing I'm calling uh, Seasons of Creativity. And uh, it's it's morphed a little bit from um, simply being really focused on the dynamic of getting what's in, out, and on the canvas, and then the dynamic of doing it all, creating with others a large group canvas, to uh, the request has been to do a workshop that's about building a body of work, then getting that organized and creating your identity and getting yourself out into the world to then get shows going and, and all that stuff. So that's what it's it's morphed into. Um, so that's going to be an interesting adventure to, to see if I can get some people to get off the dime and build a body of work and throw it in the world. <laughs> so anyway, there's cards back there if you're of interest. You can grab some of those. And are there any more questions? And thank you for listening to my stuff. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I had a thought when Michael was talking, all this stuff was just jumbling around in my head. And this idea about putting yourself out there. Whenever you do a work of art or anything, it says everything about you. Everything. Even if you're not trying to. Especially if you're not trying to. It says everything about you. So you might as well just let it out and be honest about it. But that's the message I get. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I, I actually, in the workshops, and thank you for what they would, don't go back, uh, but for what you just said, because I really believe what I'm about to say uh, from that from the Rorschach ink block kind of thing that we have some familiarity with, that everything we do is a Rorschach snapshot of where we are right now. And like it or not, it's on there. It's on there. Standing up here right now is the fact that he's had his health problem recently. That's standing right here, as well as all these other things. And so, like it or not, it's there. So, so rather than show people your fear, your trepidation, show them your beauty, your boldness, all that other stuff. That's why you're sitting here in the first place. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael will be in the back. And uh, do you want to close? Uh, <laughs> well, yes.